Hello and welcome to Cambridge Skeptics Live. Cambridge Skeptics are a non-for-profit educational organisation for the promotion of scepticism and critical thinking in the Cambridgeshire area and beyond. Uh, and tonight we are very pleased to welcome Dr John Lambie to uh, join us, who's going to be talking about how to be critically open-minded. Over to you, John. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for inviting me and it's great to be here. Um, and uh, my talk, yes, it's called How to Be Critically Open-Minded. And um, let me just uh, explain who I mean, just get myself clicking through my slides. Yes. So, yes, my name's uh, John Lambie. I'm prof Associate Professor of Psychology at Anglia Ruskin University. Really, my area of research is sort of emotion, really, and emotion regulation. Uh, I do a bit of CBT therapy and that sort of thing. But actually, my background, when I did my PhD, I originally w started off as history and philosophy of science. So I've always had an interest in uh, the philosophy of science. And I suppose that's why I got into this area of, uh, you know, open mindedness and thinking. And I did write a book on it, 2014, but I don't really think I kind of solved anything with that book. And I had lots and lots of ideas. Um, and I think things have sort of, in a way, got worse in the sense that or what I thought was a problem that people were not critically. Oh, someone's got the book. Chris has got the book. That's amazing. Um, I didn't it's, think it's anyone. From AI it. University. <laughs> it's, it's from the University Library. I, I oh, it's from the University Library. Library. Good, <laughs> good. That's how I, I approve of that because it's too expensive. Um, the uh, you know when I when I wrote it, I thought there was a problem with people not being criti critically open-minded enough and I didn't just mean kind of politicians I actually meant scientists as well I meant sort of my colleagues you know um, but also of course the world of politicians and people on the internet etc but I kind of think it's got worse but I don't know whether I've got the answer to it or indeed whether there needs to be an answer to it you know maybe I'm wrong and actually it's fine that people are not critically open-minded. I mean, I'll, I'll define what I mean by it. Um, I'm really interested but, to know whether it's directional, the wrongness is directional, like are they not critical or are they not open-minded? Yes, no, that's right, but I do distinguish that. So I do have kind of, there's two ways of going wrong, yeah. You could be not open-minded or you could be not critical. That's a great point, yeah. So so you, you, you could um, fail to sort of switch theories which would be lack of open-mindedness, but then you could fail to switch for kind of rational reasons. Like if you just switch randomly, you're yeah. kind of not critical enough. So it is it is a combination of you're open to switching theory, but you 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 do it in a sort of rational way is the sort of idea. So that's, yeah, that's there's, a great... there's a sweet spot that we should be... The sweet aiming. spot. And that's why it feels almost like a sort of, not exactly contradiction, but quite hard to find that spot where you mm. you kind of switch for rational reasons. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. I have, I have a sort of slide on that. Um, and um, just to give a kind of definition to start with, it's just this idea that you're willing to, it's what I've just said really, you're willing to shift your point of view or your theory on the basis of reason and evidence and in order to seek the best ex explanation. I know there's kind of three things there and we can unpack them a bit, but just to sort of say that there's this idea that you shift your point of view and you do it in order to try to get a better point of view um, is kind of the idea that that you're not just randomly doing it. Um, and I, I'll unpack that a bit more. Um, and just to kind of say, you know, this this idea is familiar in in philosophy, although I'm not a, a philosopher, you know, and I'm sure you could find it in so Socrates and that sort of thing. But in recent philosophers, you know, John Stuart Mill, it's the idea that rationality, in a way, is about corrigibility, it's about correcting your mistakes, you know, someone is rational, if they're capable of rectifying their mistakes by just, I, I do like the use of the term discussion and experience. Um, and it might be that actually, that's all you need because later on I start talking about things like Bay I'll say a little bit about sort of Bayes Bayes theorem and stuff like oh, that. Oh, excellent! But but we're saying I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to mention it and hope okay. that other people know more about it than me. But 
maybe you don't need to even go that technical. Maybe you can just say discussion and experience. And then the other one that I've it's, got. It's, is it's interesting that your background is in uh, history and philosophy, because I learned a lot yes. more about history than I expected to from reading this book. It's very much yes. a historical perspective on the subject. Yes. I think the his history is how I got into it, actually, which I'll come on to. The thing yeah. that got me into this was actually reading some history. Um, yeah, and it's not at all technical. I was, it was very easy reading, I thought. Oh, good. Oh, thank That's nice to hear. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll come on to that in a moment, Chris. It's great because I'm about to do a, a very quick uh, Erasmus and Luther bit of history because I love this example. But the Karl Pop, I do love this this as well, uh, this quote, I may be wrong, you may be right, by an effort we may get nearer to the truth, which Karl Popper sort of was talking about, uh, again, it's very much like the John Stuart Mill, but it's a sort of, it's sort of a criterion of rationality that's saying that um, you're willing to sort of change your mind, but also it's saying we may get nearer to the truth. So it's not just saying I'm willing to say that I'm wrong, but I'm saying, I also like the use of the word we. We mm. may get nearer to the truth. So it's kind of like, I'll learn from your, you've got a different point of view. One of us might be wrong and it could be me, uh, but together we'll try to get nearer, nearer, nearer to the truth. So I think that captures the attitude. Um, and then and here's where I'll just do- is, is the exact uh, opposite of anything that anyone has ever said on Twitter. Like, yes. It yes. looks like it could be a tweet just from the, the, the punchiness and pithiness of it, but actually in terms of content, no one has ever adopted such a generous posture. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing? That I mean, Twitter just doesn't allow that to happen. And, and so that would be very interesting to, you know, use that as an example of maybe just the, you know, almost a paradigm of sort of how to foster closed minded th thinking, you know. Um, so yes, my two examples. I just want to give fa fairly fairly quickly to just give one. One's a kind of, um, I suppose, the theological scholarly one, and one's a kind of science science one. But I do like this example because this got me into this topic, where I, I was always interested in the Pro Protestant Reformation. Did it at O level, and I always kind of thought, oh yeah, Martin Luther's a bit of a kind of rebel, isn't he? He's a bit of a kind of free thinking. Um, hero of kind of critical thinking. And then I started reading some of the stuff that Martin Luther had written. And I thought, oh my God, he's not that at all. He's like a kind of really uh, aggressive, sort of dogmatic person. Um, and what, 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 what one, of the, one of the things where this comes across is that you've got Erasmus and Luther writing the same sort of time. And they had a debate about free will Luther was against free will, Erasmus was pro-free will. But the, the, the thing that's interesting is just the tone of how they write about it. So I don't really care for this talk about who's right about free will or not. I'm sure you can have another skeptics debate about that that will never end. But, but this is just the attitude. So Luther says, and there's loads of these, your book is so contemptible and worthless. Although you write wrongly, I owe you no small thanks because you've confirmed my view. No, and that is then, totally a tweet right there. That, that totally you can put on Twitter today. Totally a tweet. And what you get with Erasmus is constant because they'd have a back and forth. And it took them a bit longer than tweets. They had to write these little books <laughs> to each other. Erasmus, you know, even if I've understood what Luther discusses, it's altogether possible I'm mistaken. I merely want to inquire not to dogmatise. I'm ready to learn from anyone who advances something more accurate and or more reliable. So I've highlighted your kind of, you write wrongly, you confirm my view. It's possible I'm mistaken. I want to inquire. I'm ready to learn. And then he's got the accuracy criterion. It's really interesting because these are both religious uh, thinkers. And I don't think it's true that religion is necessarily closed minded, although there are some examples where religion goes down that route. But um, certainly Martin Luther is absolutely full of it. Uh, here's another one. Uh, I ought not to allow you to err in this matter. One must delight in assertions. Let me define an assertion. I mean a constant adhering to and affirming your position, avowing it, defending it. And he's kind of saying this is, I mean, he's an, he's an intellectual, but he's sort of saying the thing you should do as an intellectual is to just affirm your thing. Uh, and I thought you'd like this because you're the sceptic yeah. society. So great is my dislike of assertions that I prefer the views of the sceptics. Um, it's just really to because I thought I'd use an example that's not not from from Twitter, but to see that this this has been going on quite a long time. This kind of 
different different style of thinking your kind of dogmatic thinking and your open thinking and actually i think perhaps it has got worse and it's really hard to find examples it's interesting your point erica that to find examples of people doing critically open thinking is quite hard and you don't see it on a tv debates or on twitter you know so actually um I don't know, you know, you, it, it is interesting. The other one I want to just give a quick one because of the the um, the shifting of theory. So I did want to give a science example. Sometimes I use Gat Galileo, but just, just to do this one, John Tuzo Wilson's a bit less well known, but he, it's the field of geology and um, he, what's nice about it, there's a series of papers um, and if where he changes his mind about what's the explanation of there's various things about earth geology about mountain ranges and islands and things like that and he says there's four theories he has four theories one of them's contracting earth expanding earth can't remember the third one and the fourth one is continental drift which he thinks is the most stupid one he's, he's got the least evidence and then gradually the papers he starts to go, no, actually, I think the continental drift one, which is where the continents all were together and then they drifted and they smashed into each other. He goes, no, that's the one that's got the best evidence. So he gradually changes. So it's a really nice idea. And I think that you don't see that enough in science. In fact, I never see it in my colleagues. It's very rare to see papers, certainly in psychology, which is a thing I know about, in which people go, theory A, theory B, which one is better they, they nearly always people kind of go they've always got an agenda and they're always trying to support a hypothesis usually so it's here's, how, that, here's, here's my structure rating. here's why it's right yeah else. here's why it's right seek there's all sorts of sharp practice there's, there's there's kind of like uh analyze as much data as possible and then fish for the ones that support the what i want to say there's a lot of that going on there's no kind of but and I think the simple thing of just if you just did kind of go right, I'm going to put three theories up, and then I'm going to see how the data differently supports. There's a few you can find a few really old papers that do this in such, such psychology, but it's very rare to see that now. Um, it's also it, our whole our whole way of thinking is set up in a more adversarial way, um, yeah. like our legal system. Um, yes. is it's set up in, in this adversarial way. It's, it's you know you're you're intended to portray a single perspective and then the truth will emerge by yes. some other person that's right who decides not which is the compromise that is correct but which of the two no. sides is correct but i guess at least in that when you're in the courtroom you get both of them you do get both True. of the points of view whereas i think sometimes you get sometimes you might get sort of papers which don't really tell you the other side you know as much but, at least but on in an court, individual level two. we are trained to represent a single perspective and we have yeah. been for 800 years. Yeah. And in fact, there are scientists that advocate it. Another thing I sometimes do is Karl Popper versus Thomas Kuhn, because sometimes people think Thomas Kuhn is like, oh, yeah, he's the kind of relativist one. But he's not. Thomas Kuhn is the one that says scientists should be dogmatic. And mm. that, and that um, when he first came to talk in London, people were outraged by him going, oh, yes, normal science. He says normal science is you train PhD students to not challenge anything. And the only way you get progress is that a new don't. lot of people come along and oust the other people, which actually people like Karl Popper and uh, some other people were sort of outraged by this. He was saying, no, you know, you shouldn't be dogmatic. Everyone should be critical. But anyway, that's, a, that's another thing. That's another example of this, actually, because there is a school of thought that says, scientists should actually be dogmatic and then you just through through sort of i don't know survival of the fittest or something um you 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 kind of get a change of theory anyway um uh, sorry sorry just before we move yes. on from that doesn't that doesn't wouldn't that slow the progress of science aren't, aren't scientists supposed to be i suppose be dogmatic until the evidence doesn't support anymore and then they formulate or ascribe to a new theory and test that like if, yes. you, if you had to be dogmatically uh committed to whatever it was that you were uh whatever theory it was you picked up when you first started sciencing wouldn't that yeah would that lengthen the process of science by forcing it to take generations rather than exactly sort of 
And isn't that arguably why, like, the 1920s experienced such, like, rapid advances in, like, our understanding of physics and chemistry because everyone had died in the First World War? That's one theory that I've heard. It's one thing, yeah. (laughs) But it's interesting because sometimes people say that, and and there's a sort of irony because they attribute it, I think, they might attribute it to Max Planck, where he says something like, you know, it's just the new theories happen because the people die, you know. But the irony is that he's a living example that refutes it because Max Planck actually constantly changed his mind. So he kind of like, he actually Uh started a sort of quantum theory. Then he accepted Einstein's relativity theory. He then accepted the new version of quantum theory. So it's kind of, you know, it doesn't quite ring true. You get these, there were people who lived through it all. Yeah, yeah. You know, who didn't just start, you know, they changed their mind. the thinking themselves rather than simply resisted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting. yeah. Um, so, yeah, the structure of it, um, maybe I'll skip through this because I think it's a bit obvious, this kind of all of this. I want to, what I want to get is to this. I think this is, this is just a bit more interesting, um, is that um, I, I think that I was trying to work out the structure of what, what critical open-mindedness is. Um, and, well, may, maybe I will go back briefly to this, <laughs> where I was just sort of wanted to say that you, you you have this idea in closed mind that you know people just rule something out and when they're open-minded they can switch like this and and that they switch for rational reasons and that the idea is that your assent to a theory is always provisional so you you never really would say i'm a hundred percent certain um you'd have to say i'm you know you you just have to say i'm more you know i i give this theory greater credibility than this this one um and now i'll move 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 to this so the structure of it i think um so i've got three things there capacity attitude and then rationality and the capacity is just an obvious thing that of that that is just saying if you can't literally your an infant who can't do this or an animal who can't do this or someone who's had brain damage that you know you can't shift perspective then obviously you can't really enter into this at all um so there's capacity uh re- you know that that that's a basic given but and then i've got attitude which i've put carl carl popper's i may be wrong you may be right together we can get nearer to the truth um and then i've sort of got rationality criterion where, where I was saying you, you do use some sort of evidence and reason to update and I put for example Bay, Bayesian uh, a, a approach doesn't have to be that um, and but then I think what's interesting or the thing I can comment most about in a way as a psychologist is the attitude bit because I think without the attitude nothing really gets going um, and so I'm interested in what factors affect the attitude because as Erica was saying you don't really see that attitude on 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 Twitter. Where 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 can you get that attitude, and where what stops that attitude from happening? Um, so that's one thing I wanted to talk talk about. Um, and here's where again it was Erica's point about two versions of it going wrong. So the dogmatism would be things like, I know I'm right, I need to show you that you are wrong. So that's obviously not the attitude of, I may be wrong, you may be right. I need to win. So any of those, I need to win, I need to show you you're wrong. Is, is, and that's what you've got with the Martin Luther, for example. You could then just have something that rejects any kind of rationality. Um, and what's interesting about this is, I know you're called the Skeptic Society. Obviously, there are skeptics when you go back to, I mean, you know greek skeptic i mean you'll get people that are skeptical of everything like if you're skeptical of rationality you might get people that's all like they're so skeptical that they say it's all just everything is it's a bit like david hume you know everything's just emotion you know it's like well, he's so skeptical. That's the problem that we face in with like our use of this term is it's it's not an ideal term because it can lead to misinterpretations like that but it's the one that this movement has has coalesced around it's the least bad option yes but what we what we are not saying is you know somebody who is a climate change denier who is using say dogmatism to do reasoning around climate climate change yeah they might use the word skeptic 
to say that they are climate they are skeptical about climate change, but yeah, in fact yeah. they are they are denialists. Exactly, yeah. And I think they're not I think one way around it, I was thinking about this, is that you almost need to be a sort of second order skeptic. It's like that it's not enough to just be a skeptic where you just you just sort of deny things. You have to kind of be skeptical about the skepticism. You have to go, no, I'm a if you're a sort of proper skeptic, you, you would sort of go, well, you know, it's not just that you're you know, it's not enough to be skeptical of climate change. You have to be skeptical of being skeptical of climate change. Do you see what I mean? It's like <laughs> you're, you're it's actually, not. <laughs> we're, we're having a chat that, that sort of relates to this this morning. Is to like we were talking about the kind of the topic of are there things that you shouldn't study? Uh, it's kind of tangential mm. to something else we're talking about. But yeah, um, within within that, there there is that sort of second order of like, well, actually, <sighs> there are some things that whilst we may be interested to know the fundamental truth of them actually knowing the truth of them itself is harmful to an extent around certain things around race and and, and other similar sort of topics because right. bigots may end up using that to um to cause harm yes. so there's, no, there's there's you know you have yeah. you have to have this this yeah there's higher reasoning not just thinking about things but thinking about the thinking about things yes that's interesting yeah yeah um no that's right i mean it's interesting yeah i've just realized i mentioned david hume i didn't put emotion in my my not my thing that i said if you're not using rationality what are you using and i've put authority revelation whim intuition i should have put emotion because actually you get that famous quote from david hume reason is the slave of the passions he's a skeptic that reason is a thing you know he's saying it's just a rationalization so you you know everything's just your emotional preference and then you find a reason for it if that's true then critical open-mindedness doesn't exist you know and i think you then just have non-critical you've just got people thinking that they're critical and really they're just they're just changing their minds for emotional re reasons i think you know, we, so I, so that's that would be another group of people I'd have to fight against if I was trying to argue for this. Um, but I don't think so. so anyway, let, let's move on. So it, the factors affecting. So this is where I was thinking. This is this is quite interesting. Like, what affects this attitude? What promotes the attitude? And um, what, what prevents it? So I thought preventing it. I've put them as social, ideological, and psychological. So a really big one is group processing. There's things called identity-motivated reasoning. You fit in with your group. And we, we all do this. And this is a big one because this is things like, you know, well, I'm Labour, so I believe in high taxes and public ownership those are the things i believe in you know tories believe in uh low taxes and cutting spending and it's almost like you and i even myself would feel uncomfortable going well, well it's almost like you think well that's my identity if i then go no i've i've looked at the research and actually i'm updating my belief it would be much better that i now agree with what the tories are saying you might think, oh, I can't really do that. So these are these are the examples of this kind of identity motivated things. And obviously it goes across a whole set of things. It could be political affiliation, religious affiliation, um, even things like, you know, supporting a football team and things like that. Then you've got the ideological things. The, on the, yeah. Well, I, I was going to say, like, um, during the the first lockdown, I decided, well, I'd go out and take some of my political views and see whether or not they were actually backed up by, by science. And I, you know, I, well, some people well, baked, yeah. other people did that. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but like I was, you know, I went to, a, I went to a grammar school, like, you know, past 11 plus, I looked yeah. at sort of my, my peers and thought, well, actually, you're all developing really well here or better together. So I, I've been a, been a fan of grammar schools. And whilst there's not been an awful lot of research into their impact, the, yeah. the, the what has been done seems to suggest that actually having a grammar school system allows the sort of better off kids to do a bit better, worse off kids do a bit worse, and those kids that are 
do poorly in multiple subjects end up significantly worse off um, in a grammar school right. system. And actually, they might be a net negative. And so that's something that whilst it was like having been through a system, I had sort of a, a, a strong amount of support for. Yeah. Um, I found myself home to change. So do you think you've changed your view? You... Did you oh, find yeah, it yeah, threatened because... your identity to change your view on that in some way? Um, I found that it, to an extent, because I think that without a grammar school system, I wouldn't be where I am. And so I am a beneficiary of a system that, that unfortunately, actually has, whilst it's benefited me, has hurt others. And I found that difficult yeah. to process. Yeah. Such a psychologist question, by the way. Very incisive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, you've got, so anyway, it was the social thing. So, this sort of identity group thing. Then there's ideological economic. I think it's massive, you know, that you, you kind of, uh, there's vested interest in a per point of view. It could just be, is part of your job. You could be a scientist who's got a theory that, has got lots of funding and you're well known for it, you're too invested in it to suddenly turn around and say, I realize my theory is wrong. You could be a YouTuber who gets lots of hits um, by holding a certain point of view. My son showed me somebody who has a channel saying, change my mind, change my mind. And he wears a t-shirt saying, um, you know, I'm against abortion, change my mind. And he goes out but my son was saying, "There's although he's got like 50 videos, he's never changed his mind. So it feels like um, that would be great if it, it sounds like it's not, um, he's not getting the followers by actually changing his mind. So it's sort of, it, you know, it feels like there's a kind of, you know, his, his, uh, his shtick is to not change his mind. Um, yeah. Uh, We've um, John, so I'll just this, cut in. Roger. Yeah. Sorry, if I might cut in just for a sec. Got a question in the chat, which I think is kind of relevant to what you're talking about yeah. on the yeah. topic of cognitive dissonance, which is it's oh, kind yes. of that, you know, um, one of the reasons why people might not be changing their mind is because the idea causes them some discomfort. Yes. So they, they might assume, well, absolutely, I, I'm definitely right. Or there's these other reasons that explain why I'm, I don't need to change my mind in face of the evidence and stuff. So, yes. Well, actually, that's interesting because the cognitive dissonance, I suppose I've I've put psychological, I ward off anxiety by hold, holding this view. And obviously cognitive dissonance is sort of anxiety generated by clashing beliefs, isn't it? Rather than, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, cognitive dissonance, I think it is interesting because I think it can go either way because it could be something that generates you to, I, I think tr traditionally the idea is that you sort of, you ward it off by, I mean, I had this, I've still got it myself over sort of veganism and stuff like i believe that i should be a vegan um and i'm not fully a vegan yet but I, but th there's two ways you could go you could sort of go um well i'm gonna sort of argue i'm gonna rationalize that actually you no know, dairy dairy farming is fine you could do you could reduce the cognitive distance by saying i'm going to actually um tell myself that dairy farming is fine or i'm going to sort of not think about it or you could live with the dissonance and then gradually eventually change your mind. In fact, that has happened to me with, with other things. But but yeah, I mean it's I think it cognitive dissonance is something that I think can go either either way. Um but often people want to keep their beliefs consistent and so they in keeping their beliefs consistent, they might become more closed minded because you might think, well, I've got to like not open myself to that because that will contradict what i already believe yes yeah, so that is a good point I, I got the impression from the book that you thought cognitive distance was a positive or even an essential thing if we're going to be able to hold two different ideas in our mind yeah at the same no, that's time. right no i think you but i think that's maybe not cognitive dis I, I don't know maybe it depends what's meant by cognitive dissonance i think it's sort of i think i talk about containing the ability yeah. to contain multiple views but I think in cognitive dissonance, you kind of get you get stressed by it. So you actually you actually try to change one of the views, I think, in the classical meaning of it. So rather than cognitive dissonance being necessary, it's more like 
cognitive containment you could call it something like that sort of the ability to contain uh, there is that thing keats calls negative capability which i think is is uh, i think it means the ability to c hold opposing beliefs without getting without it's, it's almost it is the the anti-cognitive dissonance it's sort of like you you contain them without trying to change one of them i may have got that slightly wrong but um so the other thing on the psychological actually i'll I, i'll move on to this because because again this is something i know a bit more about i just want to say a little bit about psychological factors that are to do with interpersonal emotion reg regulation so um i think that a lot of um the the, the thing about being open-minded the way i've defined it is you have to actually be you basically have to have this i'm okay you're okay attitude which you could call interpersonal equality or something like that if you kind of don't have that then the whole i may be wrong you may be right together we can get near to the truth never really gets off the ground and i think but one of the problems is this i'm okay you're okay attitude and it's very familiar for anyone who's sort of been a therapist or has looked in to this is that actually it's quite it's quite common to not have that for various reasons um and uh it might be that people think they're not okay and other people are superior to them or that they think they're superior to other other people um and in fact um you might get this called spitting you don't really need you don't really need to call it that you can just call it um the fact that good and bad are massive massive categories in our language and probably in our evolution as well because of pain and pleasure they're the biggest sort of connotation if you if you ask people for connotations of words you know the biggest variance is people can say things are good or bad if you then start applying this to people if you kind of if you um are brought up in a way that you're led to believe that these things should be separated there's good people there's bad people there's there's worthless people there's great people you're either up you're either down you're either a winner or a loser if you've at all got that attitude i think you're going to really struggle with critical open-mindedness mm. and this is where i think twitter might come in that often arguments activate you don't have to have a personality disorder we all can do this we could all get activated into this people with personality disorders might be slightly more extreme um what but, about um I, like personality characteristics like i don't know um we, we've talked on this group before about like the the big five personality traits and, and other things like right. that i don't know where yeah. that sits in relation to some of this i really don't know there is one called open-mindedness well that, that's what i was thinking, I was thinking about, I was thinking about the openness. Not, yeah openness isn't it openness to experience and it's actually it's not it probably that probably does relate to this a bit but um i don't really know i haven't really looked at it in terms of it's not really my thing personality mm. you know the big five and all of that um but i suppose openness to experience would 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 be the one um I mean, what i've got here is i've brought up n narcissism you know believing you're better than others trying to put others down and again you've got this kind of you know i'm i'm sure I, you know it's pretty obvious that narcissists are actually not people who think they're better than other people they're people that worry that they're not better than other people so they constantly have to put other people down uh in order to enact a sort of emotion rate regulation uh because um they don't want to be down you know if you if you genuinely thought you were better than other people i think you'd shut up about it i mean there's no need to kind of where, where's the anxiety in that the anxiety is i don't really think i am i don't want to be down don't want to be down so i've got to pop, constantly put other people down and, and if you've ever in the presence of somebody with extreme versions of this it's it's almost comedic um how often somebody will tell you how kind of great they are relative to how rubbish you, you are in extreme ver versions but 
so these kind of things, I mean, you know, you can see these sorts of things. I've put, I mentioned Martin Luther there. There's, there's quite good biographies of Martin Luther that kind of does fit this Adolf Hitler, Donald Trump. But we've all got a bit of this. There's certain attachment types, I think, that lend themselves to this avoidant attachment. People tend to think they're strong and weak people and that they're strong. And um, I hesitate to say because I don't want to be political, but in and I'm not saying but in the current Tory party, because they got rid of a lot of nice people, I feel yeah. they're left with a lot of people who kind of have got this interpersonal style. You know, I'm not saying all Tories that but they got this sort of the you sort of apprentice um contestant, you know, who's like contemptuous of weakness, you know. And it's a strange thing. And you know, lazy people, weak people. It, obviously racism's like that let's put all the negative characteristics onto this racial group you know it's get it off me get it off me um and you, you, you see but it, it you know, like donald, donald trump enacts it all the time all his racism is very kind of putting all kind of very negative characteristics on on other on, on other groups but but so this is definitely a problem for critical open-mindedness because as soon as you and as i say i'm not just saying oh there's a whole group of people who are narcissists and there's something wrong with them i'm kind of saying we all slip into this a bit we we get activated you know somebody i'm arguing with somebody and suddenly i feel a bit put down and i think i want I'm, i want to win this and i get all anxious you know we we, we're, we can all get into this and that's where i think the, the whole the twitter things just go down a rabbit hole don't they because people get angry and insulted and before you know it, you've got people kind of trying to win. You yeah. know, I've got to win. I've got to put you down. I've got to put you down. And these horrible debates around kind of, well, we all know what they are. There's certain sort of toxic debates, aren't, aren't they, around abortion or gender identity and things that have just become kind of just horrible to sort of go into because it's just people kind of shouting at each other. Um, so anyway, that's a bit of... Well, sorry, I was just going to... And yeah. I do think, certainly from, from my own experience here, you talk a bit about politics. I think, I suppose there's a couple of things, which is that within, within the Tory party, individual responsibility is, is often lauded as the, the ideal. Yeah. And so that is something that naturally lends itself to people who maybe are critical of others, but less open. Yes. Whereas. Yeah. The likes of Labour and Lib Dem are maybe more around, more interested in caring for people, more collective, yes. which is lends itself maybe more to the openness, but less so to the criticalness, because that involves putting other people, you know, to an extent, yeah. as you've described here, can often be seen as putting other people down. And it's yeah. something that I, I know has been correlated with, not especially strongly, but has been correlated with political um, ideology, is your, your essentially how critical you are versus how collective open-minded you are right so yes there's a little bit of, yeah yeah that's right um but i am a bit wary of this kind of thing because i don't want things to degenerate into kind of what people might think as sort of ad hominem attacks on people but i think right. if we all own up to it it's rather than saying you're all biased this group you're all biased it's like i think you have to start from the assumption that we're all biased for different reasons and we've got to try and see through a little bit our own you know so i'm going to come on to it in a moment about a little bit of self-awareness to see you know you might spot the narcissism in yourself you know when you're having a twitter argument with some somebody so it's 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 to say you know we're all we're all subject to these processes um I wanted to end with actually because I was kind of saying all these things and I thought well I'll try and address something and so I pulled up a sort of recent climate change paper where people try to address some of these issues and I thought I would just look at how I just sort of comment on it because there's bits where I agree with what they say and bits where I don't agree with what they say and I thought you guys might be able to help me on whether I'm I need to sort of give up critical open-mindedness or change how it's um, conceptualized because it was some things that came out of this paper. So I'll just I'll just put put them out there. 
because I thought it'd be nice to have, have an example. So they've got this paper called The Evidence for Motivated Reasoning in Climate Change Preference Formation. So they're, they're mm -hmm. trying to analyze why it is that people, um, uh, they're, they're trying to show why is it that people, um, well, ba basically what they're saying is in America, why is it Democrats support, you know, Democrats support climate change, uh, uh, support man-made, uh, human human made theory of climate change and Republicans don't and they're trying to sort of talk about that and the whole motivated reasoning idea is the thing I mentioned about group group motivated reasoning is a bit like well because I'm because I'm labor I uh, I think this because I support Arsenal I think it definitely wasn't a penalty you know my, my reasoning is motivated by uh, sort of my group 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 identity so what they say is they kind of start off by saying well really ideally we should all use Bayes theorem and I did um, uh, sort of uh, do I have a slide on Bayes theorem? well I do but I didn't so so they're kind of saying you know there, there should be a there should be a process where you you have a prior theory and you get new evidence and you, you update your theory but then they say well look, people um, don't do that because they might um, be motivated uh, to not change their theory, but they also say they might just give low credibility to certain evidence. So what they say is they might still be following Bayesian principles. And obviously people don't literally, very few people get their calculator out and, and calculate their probability of belief using Bayes theorem, but they follow it, they sort of do it informally um, but they were sort of trying to say that some people do, they do kind of, they are interested in accuracy. It's just that they give a low credibility to evidence. So they'll just go, well, I read it. You know, they'll say things like, well, I know the scientists say that, but I don't believe in science. They'll say things like that. Or mm. they'll just say, I think those scientists are just, um, they're all part of the, the great hoax or something. So in a way they're just saying i give that low credit cre credibility um so there's this problem that people might um you know not be updating you know they're not updating their theory according to evidence not because they're kind of um stupid people who don't understand the logic of base theory but they've just decided that the evidence is bad so that, that's one thing that they talk about. I haven't put any slides up showing Bayes theorem. I, I did have some of those, but I thought it, I don't want to get bogged down in that. But And I'm sure some of you probably know more about it than me. But just the, the idea that there's a kind of rational process to kind of update your prior theory based on the new, the new ev evidence. But anyway, they talk about this, that, you know, Democrats and liberals believe human activity is a primary cause of climate change. Republicans, conservatives don't. They vary in what they consider to be cre credible evidence. Both groups might not really update if the evidence is um, goes against what they think. So you might show them a video saying it's all a big hoax. Climate change is all a big hoax, and that might not work. That might not work for that. Democrats might not update on that because they'll just say that's bad evidence. So obviously, you've got this this kind of issue where it's quite hard to kind of grow it feels quite slippery really like if we're saying oh we should all be rational and update our theories but there's so many ways that you could in a way i think what they're saying is people could kind of say they're still being rational it's just that you know if the theory if the evidence is weak credibility then i shouldn't update um Anyway, there's also this evidence in this paper that they say it's quite a big problem in America that it's got worse and worse. It, it, the polarization has got stronger and stronger. So this effect of Democrats supporting climate change action, Republicans not, has been getting wider and wider and wider. So clearly people are getting, in a way, they are people are updating their beliefs in opposite directions because of whatever YouTube videos they're watching. I don't know. That people are going like that. Sorry, but on 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 that um, on that point, how yeah. much of that is, I suppose, a internal discrediting of 
sources or how much of it is is to a certain extent um, dictated to them by the media that they consume and the yeah. recommendation algorithms. You know, if yeah. it might well be that that you know they see a lot of views and dis disregard some and give them low credibility, or it might well be that actually because of what they they consume, yes. they only see one point of view. Well, yeah. I, I think this this paradox is entirely consistent with a Bayesian mechanism, and I will unpack yeah. that sentence. Uh, <laughs> um, like that. Yeah. I, I think so. I mean, a, a Bayesian, you know, worldview or Bayesian decision making is like, I'm going to visit family in Canada at Christmas. On average, I know that the weather is going to be cold enough for snow. If I were packing right now, I would, you know, put certain items in my suitcase, but I'm going to update my Bayesian prior. You know, I have this prior based on past experiences yeah. of what the weather's like at Christmas. I'm going to update that prior by looking at the weather forecast in a couple of days before. And maybe I'll need, yeah. you know, different different clothing. Yeah. And and the I think people are still seeing the evidence and they're still going through a process cognitively yes. of having the option to update their evidence. But the hard part about Bayesian logic if anyone has ever built a Bayesian model for anything, the hard part isn't putting the model together, it's working out what your priors are. It's working right. out what the distributions are. And yeah. I think what's happening here is that different people, be pop for, for yes, many interesting mechanisms like motivated yeah. reasoning are evaluating the probabilities differently. So they're still yes. going through this process of Bayesian updating. It's yeah. just that also rather than the, the, the new information is not significantly altering the prior, because they're it's 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 they they have a completely different perception of what the probability value yeah. is of that new information. I think and that's what Brockman and McGraw. Sorry, the strength of your prior as well. So not only yes. here is my prior, but also actually this is how much weight I'm giving my yeah. prior. Yeah, I think that's what that. they're saying. They say Brockman and McGraw at one point. They say these people are accuracy motivated. It's mm. just that they you know and they think they're being accurate. It's just that, yeah, because of the weightings of these probabilities, they're they're not updating. You know, they're not they're not just cynically kind of saying, "I'm not going to update because." Um, well, a good example of where I've often come across uh, Bayesian being used really badly is uh, a lot of people use it as arguments for the existence of God or or the specific oh, really? miracles. And so you might get someone who's who um, is arguing that miracles do happen and they have a prior probability of the existence of god as 100 percent, and therefore of course they get a very high outcome on their miracles whereas an atheist would look at it and go the prior probability of god is let's say they go the whole way of zero percent well of course they're going to get a completely different outcome and so right yeah, yeah. If you can't evaluate the actual probability of your your prior you know, do we can't we can't put a specific number on the existence of God? Therefore, a Bayesian approach in that instance yes. is, is worthless. Yes. Are you allowed to say zero percent and one hundred percent? I thought you had to kind of have at least probably not. That you have to kind of oh, at point oh oh one. <laughs> well, I mean, we we like Michael we're Michael. people of science, so obviously, like we know that anything <laughs> could happen statistically speaking. You know, even on like a quantum level. Yeah. But a obviously, quantum like. Level. A probabilities can yeah. approach zero and approach a hundred. Yeah, yeah. So the, here's where it gets tricky because what they then do. So they're, they're trying to say they're trying to say, look, um, some of these people are accuracy motivated. It's just they don't they don't think the evidence is credible. Um, and they say and, and they talk about its identity. I've already said this. They talk about, you know, information might threaten your values or threaten your group. Um, but then they kind of say, how can we, at the end, they sort of say, how can we overcome these biases? And here's where they, basically their approach is, it's very implicit, but they're kind of going, well, we know climate, we, we know climate change is real. And or, or like we know, they don't say this explicitly, but in, implied that they say, well, we know that there is human made climate change. So how can we persuade what tricks, effectively they're saying, what tricks can we use? It's, to sort of trick people into believing that this is my take on this is where i start to get worried um because they say right how can we alter what they believe to be credible information one of the things he says is that people in america they say they just loads of people don't believe in science they give a figure saying you know there was a survey like half of people half of the people have got confident you know less than half 
American population have got confidence in the sort of scientific community. So they say what we should do is maybe get religious people to endorse, get some authorities, get some religious leaders to say, you better start worrying about climate change, people. And then they'll go, oh, I, you know, I better because this religious leader has, has said that. Um, another thing they say is you could use conformity. You could say once you start telling people that everybody's doing a thing, like everybody's now not using plastic bags, there is a sort of thing where people just, they think it's a known phenomenon, people will do what other people do. These all sound a bit cynical to me, even though I'm worried that I'm, you know, is this more important than critical open-mindedness? If you think climate change is a serious thing that's going to, you know, devastate communities, then maybe um, you shouldn't worry about critical open-mindedness and you should be talking about persuasion, which is what they're... Do you think that it would be doing. appropriate to be critically open-minded when you're jumping out of a plane about whether the parachute is safe to use or not? Yeah. Well, that's a good... Is it, yeah. like, is it, is it ethical to be critically open-minded in that circumstance? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it would be... It's more of a reflective stance, isn't it, critical open-mindedness? Mm -hmm. I suppose in in action, you don't... Yeah, you can't sort of... Or, or to encourage people to think in a critically open-minded way about the efficacy of parachutes in a skydiving situation. Yeah. If you want to take I, it out of... But I think you're right. Mind. That's almost like a... It could be, you know, in psychology, you have you have like system one, system two. You have like intuitive mm. thinking and then considered thinking and there's times when you well, should I mean, just I mean, do intuitive take it out of thinking the, take it out of the, the pressure moment time is it you know should should one write a book about you know and and use the example of maybe you should one one should think critically about whether or not to use a parachute when you're skydiving you know be critically open-minded about alternatives or or whatever I, I, and, and and the the, yeah. the question is obviously a bit of a straw man because no, there are some circumstances in which there is a clear um, physics, <laughs> science, truth-based reason that it is not relevant to evaluate alternatives. No, exactly. No, that's right. I mean, there must be, I think you're right, there must be a set of circumstances in which everything I'm saying is not really relevant because, in, as you say, in the heat of action, I mean, then, you know, having said that, even in the probably if you microanalyzed certain actions, there may be things where people should. I don't know whether the people in uh, Chernobyl, somebody made a decision where if they just waited two seconds and thought about it in a mm. critical way, maybe they would have pressed the other button. Do you know what I mean? There might be times when you haven't got time, just yeah. press the button. And but there might be other times where actually. 10 seconds of critical open-mindedness might have made a difference. So I think it's still an open question as to when you should consider the opposite. I, I sometimes mm. call this considering the opposite, you know, should you stop and just consider the opposite? There was a great example. There's a horrific uh, story about people who started crashing cars um, where they thought they had their foot on the uh, uh, brake and they had it on the accelerator. Mm. And they were just phoning in and going, I can't stop the car, I can't stop the car. And people were so, like, in the moment of anxiety, didn't actually take their foot off to think, I I've maybe my foot's on the wrong thing. They're going, I've got my foot on the brake, my foot on the brake. That was really an example where if you just considered the opposite, you would have saved your life. It's horrific, and people just mm. would just crash. Um, and I can identify that, because I remember once when um, some people were breaking into my house, and I heard them banging on the door. I went to phone the police and I literally could not remember the number 999. I kept I kept dialing 900. I was going, why is 900 not working? And it was just, I couldn't, I persevered on 900 under stress. I was like, and I thought that's the number I've known all my life. It wasn't. It. Anyway, um, but interesting how under stress you, you might find it almost impossible to switch you know you might get so narrowed in, in your book you talk about how critical open-mindedness basically averted the cuban missile crisis <laughs> yes that's based on um yeah a series of i forget what they did it's people who what do they call it um 
they analyzed um there's a method of analyzing uh decision making isn't there there's a sort of qualitative technique and i forget what they call it but they they don't call it critical open minds but they 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 use these methods to see how open people were at different crises and they give it a little score for kind of nixon and john f kennedy and various crises and you know i i don't know how valid their technique was but but it was interesting to think that they would score people on how open minded they were and then how how successful they were at averting a war that was basically it wasn't it yeah um, so yes i think my lot i'm nearly at the end now because it, this was really my so they also talk about reframing in these techniques another thing they say is reframing which is quite interesting and i was wondering because i'm wondering whether these things are closed-minded maybe they're not reframing might be okay because this is something i mentioned cognitive therapy this is something you might do in cognitive therapy but this feels a bit more cheaty to me this feels a bit more so they're saying that you reframe a thing so again they're doing this climate change thing so in this context they're trying to change the minds of conservatives and they're saying um here's a thing where you reframe one study instead of saying it's about care for the environment you say it's about protecting your homeland so instead of saying climate change is going to threaten the earth you go climate change is going to really bugger up america and it's going to our homeland is going to be destroyed they said then conservatives were it would be more in favor of climate change action so you're going right let's activate a different moral frame um and the other one they were saying um if you this is a very american context again if you say that let's use the free market to alleviate climate change they were saying all the kind of sort of free market believers are much more sympathetic than to they say yeah yeah that's a brilliant idea let's the free market do it so it's a way of reframing it so that they don't think it's a kind of liberal uh viewpoint so context, context, there's there's are you not sort of disconnecting are you not sort of isolating the very the, like the problem there and disconnecting it from other things so in the case of the climate change the implication i think that many sort of republicans in the us would see is that the only way to fight climate change is through heavy regulation taking away things that they see yeah, as their yeah, right yeah. or or um or uh as, as being yeah. sort of crucial to their identity in terms yes. of like oh i drive yes. a big truck and and do x y and z and have air conditioning through the entire house that yeah yeah know, powers a small city in africa like use the same as powers a small city in africa like that yeah. sort of thing whereas if it's like actually we're going to separate out and say well we're not going to we're going to try and reduce energy usage but we're going to try and find ways to reduce the energy differently and yeah something. exactly what if someone came up with some amazing invention you know it, it seems a bit odd mm. that you'd be that you'd necessarily if you were conservative think no i think coal is brilliant rather than why wouldn't you think you know if someone came up with some genius kind of you know cold fusion thing or something that actually made people lots of money but also saved saved the planet um it's, i suppose that's the idea of, isn't it it's part of the problem that like practicing critical open mindedness in in the sort of like popper situation or in the, in the the mm. sort of initial thought bubble diagrams that you were showing it involves another actor that you are in opposition to and yes. if that other agent is not also practicing critical open mindedness yes then um it's I, I think it's a bit of the like the way that i've seen american politics be summarized is that um you know one side is trying is behaving as if the other side is rational and the other side is not rational yes. and so the the middle ground the, the the zone of compromise keeps shifting towards the irrational act yeah the, the yeah, problem, good point, sometimes yeah. the problem with compromise is that if my position is that i don't want to eat a bar of soap and the other position is they do want me to eat a bar of soap the the appropriate thing is not to eat half a bar of soap yeah yeah yes but i think and that it, it is a problem isn't it if 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 the people you're interacting with are not doing it are not doing the critical open minded then what are you left with yeah um, and like i should be open minded to a murderer's position 
about wanting to slit my throat. I should but not it, be practicing critical open-mindedness in that discussion with that person. But it, it doesn't, no. doesn't that go back to the, the point that you made pretty early on, John, that um, actually you need a certain level of psychological safety. You need to accept that mm. it's you and the other person against the problem rather than you and the other yes. person against each other. Exactly, which is why I was saying that you, what you really need are institutions that kind of promote uh, sort of I'm okay, you're okay, which obviously lots of our institutions do, you know, like school classrooms and things, you know, on the whole, teachers are doing that. They're not, they're, they're, you know, there's interpersonal equality. You, you tend to have people saying, you know, everyone's, you know, allowed to put up their hand and have a point of view. And I think we do practice it. It's not like human beings can't do this um and it's it's fostering institutions that kind of allow that to happen and i think ironically i think a lot of religions have a lot of this in them um they have a lot of kind of you know love love your enemy uh love your neighbor you know we're all we're all kind of um we're all the same in god's eyes or whatever you know there's a lot of kind of universalism in religion not, not to and, mention sort of acceptance of contradictory ideas yeah in a single in a, within a single worldview like there's a, exactly. there's a lot of within a religion that is that is self like self hypocritical but yeah but people who are indoctrinated are, are taught to accept that yeah and i think it's almost like a contingent thing where it's people keep coming back to the sort of american example the u.s example where where it feels kind of like it's, that's gone down a very particular place where religious people sort of went Republican. And I think that's fairly more like a 1970s thing. You know, there's a lot of contingent things that have happened. Like a lot of these identity things I think are fascinating. They're quite contingent, like abortion switch around a bit. It used to be in the 60s, Republicans were quite happy to be pro-abortion. A lot of Democrats were anti-abortion. A lot of the Catholic, you know, Kennedy was anti-abortion. Mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan was pro-abortion. And, you know, and, and then things suddenly get fixed to an identity and then suddenly like, but it feels a bit, sometimes a bit random to me. There's no kind of, that. that's where it gets weird, where some of these things just, you could have had an alternative history in which some of the identity val, uh, values could be switched. You know, it's not Donald random, Trump there were, there were real conspiracies to, to, big oil got together and ensured that yeah. they targeted Republicans with, anti-climate change suspicion yeah well yeah of course evangelical yeah. movements that deliberately targeted republicans with anti-abortion yeah yeah exactly there, there could be kind of cynical actors um you know but so i think where have i got to so yeah I mean, partly if i just fin finish off that i was worried that this is all a bit cynical this persuasion but then I did wonder, should I, um, should we, you know, stop being critically open-minded over this in a way uh, because it's a climate emergency or, you know, but then have I then just given an example for closed-mindedness? Because then you could say closed-mindedness is the thing that you should do whenever you feel really, really strongly that something's an emergency. But then, you know, that's exactly what Martin Luther and people like that were doing, where they thought everyone's going to go to hell. This is an emergency. We've got to make sure that everyone follows my my view. So uh, so that's where I'm a bit unstuck. But I, I, I suppose the difference is that we have better evidence for climate change than we do for hell. For hell, yeah. What was his <laughs> evidence for that? Yeah. yeah. Um, my final thing then when i try to say my the things that i thought helped the attitude i've already mentioned them the interpersonal quality i'm okay you're okay institutions that promote that self-awareness i've already said that you know awareness of own biases universalism by which i just mean the idea that um one of the one one of it is the idea that you know it's a bit like the i'm okay you're okay that you know we, we're trying to find um views that um everybody can assent to and i think there is an idea that i'll just name check a couple of people on on this Maybe philosophers will so i've got kant and Har Har harbour mass just there are some ideas that actually 
rationality and universality go, go together. So, so actually, there is a sense in which if we all kind of got together, if somehow you could make Twitter more democratic or things more kind of, you know, the public sphere more sort of genuinely a, a sort of conversation, then actually truth is more, people are more able to uh, sort of assent to truth than they are to lies because, or to non-truths, because actually, you know, if, if someone's saying the moon is, is sort of white and other people are saying the moon is red and white striped, it's kind of everyone in the world looking out at the moon, you're, gonna, you're just going to get more buy-in ultimately to, you're not going to get as much buy-in to the moon is red and white striped. You know, the, the truth sort of has a universal feature of it and similarly lying you know this is harbour mass's point i think other people said it as well that you know you can't have lying without truth so you can't just have you couldn't have a language in which everybody lied all the time because it just wouldn't work you, you've got to have lying only works because normally when you say i'll be there at eight o'clock in the park you will be there at eight o'clock in the park and that's how you could have joint actions and that's how you can fool people to go to the wrong place. If everything you said was a lie, there would be no fooling of anyone. There'd be no joint action or sending people the wrong way. So there's a sense in which maybe language and discourse and public discourse does actually tend towards, this is my optimistic thing, it tends towards truth, but you maybe have to create conditions in which you genuinely have kind of mutual respect and things things like that which i think you you could get from re religion it's not i don't think this is a science versus religion debate really because i've already said that some re religions foster that sort of attitude anyway maybe i should stop there because i think um <laughs> I've got That's one question enough. from the, the chat to sort of yeah. round things out with. Um, yeah. I can science that, who's one of our regular viewers and has been a guest on the channel, um, wants to know, um, are there any effective means to coax people into adopting this kind of uh, rational, open-minded thinking? Um, I think it's, I mean, I suppose I've already said, you know, I, I, I think those... Um, those, I mean, it's almost like just thinking. I, I actually think that attitude, you can't really phrase it better than those two little catchphrases that I've said, which, which, you know, the I might be wrong, you might be right, together we can get near nearer the truth. And the sort of I'm okay, you're okay. It's, it's especially I'm okay, you're okay, sounds very, very trite, but I actually think it's incredibly profound. It's very profound because, um, it's actually um, a sort of assumption that there's sort of m m mutuality there and um, a, 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 a mutual respect. So I kind of think I can't do better really than just kind of saying, thinking of those two mottos, you know. I love that. I love most that popper people... quote. I, I was saying like that, that popper yeah. quote, the, the like, you know, maybe we can get close to the truth together. I am going to take that into work. You know, that's, that's yeah. such a fabulous way to, uh, like, to sort of set the scene for, pro for problem solving. Yeah. And I think most people actually agree with that. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think that's a, most people that, or, or, you know, even your sort of so-called proverbial sort of person in the street, I don't think people will go, what are you talking about? Like most people, when they're doing joint activities, you know, you're getting together with somebody to kind of do a job or talk about something. It, it, I don't think it's that controversial to say that. It's just weird how when you get into political sphere or when you get on Twitter or something, it seems to go out, out the window. Um, cool. Okay. Well, I think we're going to round uh, finish things off there. Thank you very much, John. That was a really okay. interesting conversation. Uh, I, I, I agree with Erica. I think those, those two simple little phrases are things we should all uh, definitely keep in mind. Um, so uh, next time uh, yeah. if we have a returning guest, which is very exciting. Uh, Tom Curse is coming back uh, to talk to us and he's going to be discussing the incredible uh, James Webb Space Telescope images, which I'm sure most wow. of you have seen. 
Um, I'm really looking forward. I have lots of questions. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a, if you if you have questions about that topic, definitely join us in two weeks' time, and we're gonna we're gonna pepper the poor guy with them. Um, but otherwise, thank you again, John, and thank you all the people who came along and joined us in the chat. Very engaged chat this evening. Lots of people there. It was really nice to see. Um, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. So we'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>